Hello, good evening. Uh, slightly new look, uh, slightly later time. What is it? Ten past seven. Welcome to the live show here on a Thursday, Sheffield Live TV. It's good to be back with a live show. Bit of a story of my week as I introduced the guests. Spent two and a half hours in an aircraft cabin on Tuesday and we were all decamped. Had to get off the plane and uh, uh, spent an overnight stay in a gorgeous place. Uh, but an overnight stay here wouldn't be quite no. so good, except for the company that we're keeping uh, tonight. Apologies, just the two cameras this evening. You're seeing us on one. There's another camera, which will be a wide shot on Keith Hackett and Carl Award. The camera that's chosen to go down has got very good taste because it's my <laughs> camera, which is over there. And it's taken one look and gone down. One of the busiest, man the busiest manager in Sheffield football at the moment, Carl Award of Sheffield United Ladies, newly elevated to the championship of the FA Women's Super League and a man who will never retire, former <laughs> Sheffield FIFA referee, and former manager of England's professional referees, Keith Hackett, who we see a lot of. And we're not going to be short of topics, Keith, about no. referees in the next few weeks. That is an absolute Absolutely. certainty. Absolutely. No question. I, even, if it's, even if it's good. The, the problem is that if the referees have a good World Cup, as they did at the last one, mm. I think you'd, you'd probably be the first to agree, not many people are going to be saying so. That, that is the inherent problem with refereeing, isn't it? Well, I think that good referees are the ones that are not seen. You've got to have personality and you've got to manage players. But, you know, I always say to young referees coming through, it's the players that spectators want to see. And they like to, spectators like to see good game flow. And quality refereeing can add to a game. Uh, if a referee's going to blow up every two minutes, uh, which is usually the case for the first game in the World Cup. Yeah. Believe me, having gone out at the Euros, in 88 to do Germany, Italy. Uh, there were that many people telling me how to referee. Yeah. You know, don't allow this, don't allow that, yellow card this, yellow card that. And it was all a bit of a nonsense, really. Mm. I plowed my own path. You did. And um, we're going to talk about Mark Clattenburg, who <clears throat> certainly has uh, later in the show. I can't pick up a newspaper at the moment without reading about Mark Clattenburg or reading from him because he's saying an, an awful lot of interesting things <laughs> uh, just now. Carl Award, um, in the headlines, and quite rightly so, for this elevation, you know, going up two divisions. Uh, and you've, you've only been at uh, Sheffield United Ladies for a matter of months. Um, recruited as a coach, I think, originally, and now yep. manager. And suddenly <laughs> this, you know, I mean, it's exciting, but also quite daunting, I should think. Um, it is, yeah. Don't get me wrong, it's exciting. I prefer to use that word. Um, uh, yeah, like I, I was mentioning before, it, along with, you know, working for a football club like this and everything they've done and, and they've backed us um, into the hills since I've come in on day one. But yeah, with that become, uh, comes a lot of pressure, but um, I've always been one that likes a little bit of pressure. But So that's why I prefer to say it's exciting. Um, it's an exciting project um, and one that sort of is only just starting. And what, what I said to you, you're the, the busiest football manager, and I believe I, I didn't say that glibly, but busier than Joss Lukai or Chris Wilder or anybody around here, because they've got a nucleus of a squad. You haven't. Now, because of this two division jump, just yep. how many of last season's players are you keeping for the championship? Um, for the first team, not many. Um, sort of three or four, which, um, you know, a lot of people raise their eyebrows out, but. You know, the, the group of girls have been brilliant. Um, absolutely credit to the club sort of over the last season that I've worked with them. But everybody knows the WSL is a massive jump. Um, so, yeah, there's there's three or four we think that can make that jump. Um, well, we're hoping so. So we'll put them in that environment and we'll see if we can make it. But obviously with three and four means that we've got to bring in sort of 15, 16. Um, and that's not easy. That's... Um, not easy. And, and, and you're right at the heart of that because it's not mm. just a case of, oh, I'd like X, Y and Z and get somebody else to do the deals. You're, right, you're, you're involved in all of those negotiations as well, are you? Yeah, I think naturally Sorry. with my sort of experience in contact in the women's game, um, I think the club have sort of, um, they're putting the faith in me to, to go out there and, and do that. Um, it's not been easy. I think I've, I've learned more in probably this last two weeks than than they have in the last five years. Um, you know, nowadays all the girls have got agents. Um, they're all batting really? each other off against each other. They've yeah. all got agents. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we <laughs> we've done a deal in recent days where you know an agent has um, probably would have got twenty twenty pound off it, and it's a lot of work for minimal money. But um, yeah, it's a lot of the girls have got agents. 
some some like it. I would probably prefer not to, but I like to mm. make my own mind up. You're offering full-time contracts. The downside of being the manager, I imagine you'd have had to have had, and Keith would have had experience of this with referees, and he was always no-nonsense. You mm. must have had some really awkward, difficult meetings with people, some of the players, in the last week or two, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, a lot of people thought, I think there was a lot of questions asked of how we would release current players. Um, but actually, they were all fairly realistic, um, so I think they were a little bit easier than we may have predicted. Um, we've had some awkward conversations with maybe players that we want to bring in, but we know we're in direct competition with um, local rivals, so to speak. So, ah, yeah. local rival. There is only one local rival that I can well, within so, this city, and that's your former club, yes. Sheffield FC, ladies. Yeah. So you're battling for the same players in some instances. We will be, yeah. Um, I don't know entirely their targets. I know we've obviously spoke to a couple of um, the, a couple of the same targets, and that's natural. Um, you know, they're on our doorstep. But you know, we can only do what we can do, and we can uh, we'll worry about ourselves and what we can offer. And if that's good enough, then uh, the players will come in. Mm. The Sheffield United name will help sell it. Keith won't nod to that because he's a Sheffield Wednesday supporter. But, but he's actually. Yeah. I enjoy actually, going. To, I actually enjoy admitting. going to Bramall Lane. Yeah. yeah. Prefers the loan. Mm. I, th I think it's a great. Movie. He prefers it. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah. it. I, 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 I think, I think that women's football is growing rapidly. Uh, I've seen it in, in its embryonic times in the eighties in America. Did one or two soccer schools saw the skill sets. We've seen a massive development in the skill sets of women players at the top level, and I think that. What we've seen now on television coverage is pulling more children into the game. I mean, I've got a granddaughter who's suddenly saying, uh, it's a birthday, what do you want for your birthday? I want a football kit. And, and like, my wife and I are a bit stunned and surprised by that. We shouldn't mm. be. No. So I think it's great. I think a successful team will drive other teams in Sheffield, create other teams, because yeah. everybody wants to play mm. for a professional team. It also encourage more female match officials, which the, which the game oh. needs. You imagine the, the resur resurgence of interest. I think in I think in England we're miles behind. Mm. I think that the old scenario is too many barriers, uh, or putting barriers up that are unnecessary. Um, and you know, I, I mean, I, I can remember Wendy Toms, who was a, a terrific uh, match official. Um, Getting to the getting to the line, and then having to step up to meet the men's fitness tests, which were at that time almost impossible yeah. because of a lack of sports science and all that goes through. But you know, I think that we we do certainly need more women referees. In and the game. How, how do you rate the standard of the the refereeing that you get? Oh, obviously, you're going to see a. Uh, the higher standard you hope next season but honestly what's your feeling? Um, playing in WSL even the last sort of five or six years um, I've got to be honest I think refereeing is atrocious mm. um, now because actually the level of officiating that the FA give to women's super league for whatever reason they obviously don't f see it good enough to to give us top referees um, it's poor mm. um, and, you know, you, you scratch your head sometimes. I mean, the league we've been in just, albeit two divisions below, that's astounding. Um, honestly, I, well, I, I can't even put into words the, how bad it is. Mm. Uh, is this, are these very young and experienced referees? Are we talking mainly uh, male officials, female officials? Who, who are the worst? It, um, to be honest, a lot of them were maybe um, retired, retired older people that maybe... Um, you know, maybe go out and do it for a bit of a hobby. Um, I would say in the, in, the, in the Women's Super League, it's slightly better. Um, they are getting better. Um, I must admit, there's a few really good females in the WSL. Um, two or three in particular that are outstanding. Obviously, Michael Oliver's wife. Mm. Um, Lucy, yes. Yeah, um, Kat, Kat, McC Kat McAvoy, I think. Um, mm. There's a few that, you know, are, are outstanding and you know what you're getting from them. Um, yeah. You get... I um, don't know if she says or not, but you get some some male um, referees that almost in the women's game want respect beforehand because they're male. You do. I found we found that a couple of times, um, and they'll talk to you in a way where you think, well, if you spoke the other way, 
uh, you spoke like that back, it, it wouldn't be acceptable. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think in the WSL it is improving and I think now with the FA pushing the women's game to be full-time professional, surely that's, they're going to have to match that with Yeah, quite concerning. Official. Carla's comments there. <coughs> Carla's an experienced player, many, many years at Sheffield FC and played in the Women's Super League. Yeah, Sheffield well, I, th I think that, um, again, I think it's down to the coaching and structure. I don't, I, you know, I think that they, 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 they need to consider um, a more intense training programme physically. Mm. Um, and then more regular meetings in relation to application of law, uh, understanding the game, the tactics involved, all the things that we put in, that, you know, mm. uh, in, the, and in those early 60s, 70s, we didn't have that support, but it then with the professional referees came into that zone. I brought sports science in, sports nutrition, vision scientists, and, and that's what we've got to bring into the women's game. But what's not helping it is that at a point in the career, and this also applies to referees and uh, match officials, males as well, is they make a decision. When they get to the almost like the professional level, they decide either they're going to be an assistant referee forever or they're going to be a referee forever. Mm. And that's wrong. I mean, I, I, just, I just think that we're losing too many quality what would be quality referees because they're taking that option of running the line yeah. because we're not making those key giving decisions. them a career progression yeah I, do you know my impression from watching a few women's games is that the, the women play the game in a, in a in a way that gives the match officials far more respect than the way the men play it i don't see the play acting uh, the feigning of injury i don't see as much dissent uh, on the field is uh, is that fair? I mean, clearly, it's something you're very competitive. Yeah, I, the the descent I still think you see a lot of. Um, yeah, feigning injuries and um, and cheating you don't see too much in the women's game. They get hammered by the teammates, to be quite honest. Good. But, um, mm. No, it's, it is very different. Yeah. Um, I, it's you know you would get hammered in the dressing room for stuff like that. Mm. Um, but no, I I um, I think in terms of the descent, there's a lot of it still. But it's, it is getting better. It's got better actually since um, a couple of years ago the FA introduced um, where the captains go in with the referee before um, you spend sort of five or ten minutes, the referee goes over everything and they almost put it on to you as captain to relay that to the dressing room and make sure that they abide by it. And I think it was quite a clever idea actually. Mm. And I think that, that changed quite a bit. Well, let's look at the wider aspects of, of your job. It's management, which is relatively new to you. Yeah. Um, have you consulted managers, or one in particular I'm thinking of, have you had a chat with Chris Wilder about how he does the job and is he able to advise you on how to do yours? Do you know what, Chris, every time we see Chris he's been great. Um, he's, you know, he's, he's always popping in, popping out. Um, we haven't had a chat in terms of um, that side of things yet, but as you can imagine, obviously, he's been fairly busy and with the running when I first came in. It he was doesn't quite a busy have to time. sign 18 players, mind you. Yeah, yeah, but, anyway. yeah. but it's, a, it's a busy time for him. Um, but I'm pretty sure, you know, I've had numerous com various conversations with him about different things and I'm pretty sure did I'd want to knock on his door, I'm sure it would be no problem. Um, the one thing that has been brilliant is the fact that I've got access to all the staff at the academy. Um, which has helped no end um, and they're brilliant you know always offering advice for sessions or situations and it's been great. Is there a club ethos about the way that the game is approached, the way that the game is played that comes through from the first team downwards and embraces the, 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 the women's club? Yeah team? absolutely I think um, one thing I was quite pleased about and there's a culture there that you bring in sort of a, a person out before a player if that makes sense and you know it's, it's almost developing that sort of um, understanding amongst the squad of what is expected from them and togetherness um, and that sort of reflects on the pitch and I think Chris's team in particular this year has reflected that. Um, it's, you know, I've always kind of worked like that anyway um, but I've come into a club that sort of mirrors that and it, so it's fairly easy to... So the character of the person is more important to you than their ability. If they've got the ability but they don't have the character, you're not going to take them? Yeah, I mean, we've been offered a player this week, for example, who's outstanding. Um, but at the end of the day, our attitude's um, not the greatest. And, um, you know, one bad egg in a team can change everything. So whereas if we can sort of 
get a squad together that want to work hard for each other, have the right attitudes, and you create a togetherness straight away, I think you've got more chance of getting off to a good start. Does this ethos include the way the game is played? Because the one thing that we've all seen with Sheffield United over the past two seasons is an ultra-attacking, very entertaining approach. Keith, as a Wednesday oh, fan, is nodding to that. Absolutely, absolutely brilliant. The way they've played the game. Yeah, Terrific. It's, I mean, I... I you know, you sit there and you watch the team and you, you're truly entertained. Mm. And I think that's reflected in the, the spectators, numbers that come to the stadium, um, and, the, and the ability to score late. I, you know, I, I think the fitness levels have been quite remarkable. And they've got, they've got a mix, haven't they, of experienced players and some outstanding youth players, young players mm. in the team. I, I, I think Wilder has always been a good manager. Yeah. You know, and he plays the game this way, and it, we look at it, and it's the right way. Yeah. Is, is that is that? Do you consciously have that approach that we are going to attack and we're going to entertain? I've always been be more as, an attack, as a, an attacking midfielder. I've always been that way. Um, yeah. I've always had my teams that I've coached or, or managed set up that way. Um, the other coaching staff that are coming in alongside me, which I can't name until potentially Monday morning, but. Um, they are very much that way. We're going out there to, we're going to go and attack, we're going to go and win the ball back high and we're going to go and attack, attack, okay. attack. These now, are experienced people, aren't they? Coming very. Um, yeah, one, one uh, experienced at the highest level. The highest level? I would say extremely high, yeah. Yeah, right, okay. The highest. Intriguing. Yeah. Intriguing. And so you're adding to your, to, to your management team. And just before we go back to Keith on refereeing topics, where are you going to play? Because this is a whole new ball game now. We're talking yeah. Championship of the Women's Super League, and there's a spanking stadium there at Bramall Lane. So, are you going to make use? Of, are you going to be allowed to make use of that? We will be playing a number of fixtures there. Yes. A um, number of. A number of. There's um, there's some discussions going on um, around um, another venue, which I'm not quite sure what I'm allowed to discuss on that, so I'm not going to touch on it. Um, but yeah, we will be playing a number of fixtures at Bramall Lane. Okay, that's good because you have been playing at the academy, haven't you? We have, Previously. yeah, and it's a great facility. You know, we, the girls train there and they're in an elite environment. It's um, something that, to be honest, makes me want to still be playing because it's, it's an exceptional environment. Um, it's, any, any young player should want to walk through that door and, and sort of be involved in that, that set up. But um, yeah, we won't be playing there because it's not WSL regulated in terms of the pitch. No, obviously Bramall, Lake, Bramall Lane is. You can, I can just imagine a scenario of opening just the <laughs> south stand and hopefully packing the south stand and getting some good crowds behind the yeah. team. Mm -hmm. Be uh, be good to see. Um, Keith, uh, in part two, we're, we're going to talk about the way you see the refereeing at the World Cup and the kind of standards you expect. Mark Clattenburg, um, you know, I, I know you know him very well and you admire him as a referee. I pick up the paper and I, I read about his hair transplant and I read about his... Uh, and I don't blame him for this. If he's had, had a bad game, he, he used to go home and get drunk, you know, have a few beers. I, I think... I can, we can all sympathise with that. And he's also said that uh, he felt bullied at the FA by the head of referees, David Ellery, and that they didn't back him to reach the high echelons that he did. Your thoughts, generally? Um, I, I think that I'd much prefer Mark to keep his mouth shut uh, and concentrate. It's entertaining, though. It <laughs> well, humanises him. I, I, I think, you know, at the end of the day... He's, he's got a reputation of being, at one stage, the world's number one referee. He earned that through hard work, generally keeping his mouth shut. I think that those stories he ought to have saved, and put in a book sometime, which would sell quite, quite well, I think. Yeah. I think in relation to his comments ab about, if you like, the attitude of certain people at the FA towards him, um, I saw that. Uh, even I'd left my role, um, but I did see a lack of support at times uh, for him as a referee. You know, when, when you're going to referee a top game in Europe, and believe me, he had some top games, one of the things that I used to do with Howard Webb in appointing was either going to that midweek game on the Saturday he's got a big game, mm. he's going to deliver a big game, or... And it, it was in part certain choices that were made in that. Mm. And then um, after that, the question would be, are you going to have another game at the following weekend? Yeah. 
So it was about... I'll tell you what, we'll pick this up yeah. after the break. I'm sorry, Keith, but yeah, just right. eight seconds to the break, and it's the half-time whistle that's going. Only half-time. Do rejoin us in five minutes with Carla Ward and Keith Hackett. We'll <laughs> see you then. All right.